our guest presenter today. I'm so delighted to have Ellen Welty joining us. She's a research ecologist and at the Great Plains Science Program of the Smithsonian Institute. She's also a faculty affiliate with the ecology department at Montana State University. She's based in Bo Bozeman and her work examines responses of grassland plants and arthropods to management regimes and global change. She collaborates with a large number of local up to international partners to tackle big questions in ecological entomology and grassland science. And we'll be hearing her presentation titled Dung Beetles and Their Benefits to Ranch Systems. Welcome, Ellen. Thank you so much. Let me just get my PowerPoint going. So is that working for everyone? That looks good. It's still in, yep. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And thanks to Xerxes for inviting me. It's really exciting. It's an honor to be a guest speaker for a Xerxes workshop. And um, also I appreciate some introductions on dung beetles from both Stephanie and Jennifer. I think you've covered some of the things that I also wanted to talk about. So a little bit will be a review, but hopefully I'll give you also a little bit more in-depth information about dung beetles, their ecology, what roles they play in soils, and also how they can benefit ranches. I also included a little bit about my background. I'm always interested in how different people got to where they are. So I thought it might be interesting for everyone to also know my uh, role and my um, journey to my current position. So I did my graduate work in Kansas in the tall grass prairies there. I worked in at the Kansas Prairie Biological Station. A lot of my graduate work was on grasshoppers and also pollinators and their interactions with plant communities. Um, then after that, I did a postdoc at the University of Oklahoma in Norman. And this was mostly focused on the effects of nutrients on insect communities, especially sodium. So sodium is a really interesting nutrient that is required by all animals, but is not required by plants. So it puts herbivorous insects in an interesting position where they have to seek out sodium from other sources and might not be able to get it from the plants they eat. So I spent a lot of time wandering the U.S. in different grassland systems and salting the earth <laughs> to see what would happen with our above ground plant and insect communities. And then before I took this position, I also worked at the Sinkenberg Natural History Museum that's in a small town called Gelnhausen in Germany. And I had the honor to work on a, some really long term data sets. It was during COVID, so it it helped. Um, I was able to work on these data sets that were already collected, and I didn't have to worry so much about getting all the permits to do field work during the pandemic. And um, especially, I was actually working on aquatic macroinvertebrates, and we just published a big paper that's this little map at the bottom of all these sites across Europe. Look, um, with a really big collaborative team um, looking at long-term trends in those aquatic microinvertebrates, which are actually, have been increasing due to increases in water quality, but unfortunately in the last 10 or 15 years or so have started to halt their recovery. Um, also, I have this map of the U.S. This is actually all of the sites across the United States that I've done research at. You can see it's mostly focused in the grassland systems of the Great Plains from Texas up to some of our northern states and Minnesota and um, little cluster of points over in Montana, which is where I currently am. Um, and I'm currently working mostly in eastern Montana. It's a short grass to mixed grass system. 
Um, my work is focused in the northeast corner, although still covering a fairly large region. So this is like Connecticut plus um, Massachusetts or something like this. It's still pretty big, um, but not very densely populated whatsoever. It's one of our largest um, unknown regions for insect work. However, I in the wintertime, I'm based in Bozeman. That's where the Montana State University is, and it's a nice home base where I get to, to work with the university. And our program in general with Smithsonian, the Great Plains Science Program, is a small program that's at, at large in Montana, both based in the Bozeman and Missoula area. And we work widely across the state with a bunch of partners um, tribal groups, NGOs, rancher communities, um, state agencies, federal agencies, et cetera, to work on some big, exciting projects helping to do conservation in grassland systems. So I'm going to go a little bit more in depth um, on dung beetles. And so I'll just start with this kind of basic overview of what is a dung beetle. So they're, it's actually a little bit more complicated of a question than you might assume. So they're not actually just one taxonomic group. There are actually a few different subfamilies of beetle that make up the, the dung beetle group. They So that's called a paraphyletic group if you want to know taxonomic terms. Um, however, all of the beetles in these different groups, we uh, call them dung beetles because both the adults and the larvae feed on dung. Although there's also a few um, gen gen genera within this group that have spun off and are carnivorous. So there's one famous group, for example, in Peru that has switched from eating dung to eating millipedes. And it's a really interesting group that breaks off the heads of millipedes and then sucks out their insides. So large diversity of life, but um, most of the, the dung beetles, of course, are dung feeders. Um, the, the specific taxonomy is they're all within this larger sub super family that's called the scarabidae. So our scarabs. And then there's um, three subfamilies that can be defined as dung beetles, although one of them is sometimes not included. So the, the two that are always included are the scarabinidae, which is our, our true dung beetles or our large dung beetles, and the aphodiines, which are often very small dung beetles, and a lot of these live directly in the dung, and some of them are quite small. And then we have the geotrupidae. These are the earth boring scarabs. Sometimes they aren't co considered true dung beetles, but they also play similar roles and they um, will consume dung and break down dung. So I personally consider them dung beetles as well. Um, within these three groups, we have across the entire globe, um, about 9,500 species that have currently been named, but there's probably quite a few more that have not been named. Even up here in eastern Montana, you would think that in the United States, we've probably named all the dung beetles, but we've been finding some aphodiines that are unclear what they are, and they could be new species. So there's a lot of insects out there, and we still don't know a lot about them, even within more well-described systems. So as I mentioned, there's a big variety in dung beetle size. We have some of our little aphodiines at just two millimeters, and then we have some of our very large dung beetles. A lot of these are um, dung beetles that will feed on um, African large mammals, such as elephants and hippopotamus that can be up to 70 millimeters long. So yeah, huge variation, um, more than an order of magnitude difference in the in dung beetle body sizes. Dung beetles have been around on earth since the dinosaur times. That's actually been suggested that they originally fed on dinosaur dung and then later switched to mammal dung and then became quite a bit more abundant and diverse with the rise of mammals following the extinction of the dinosaurs. And dung beetles are found 
everywhere. A lot of times people don't even realize that they're found in the United States, but they're found across the globe, except for in really cold climates. So here is a map of the of dung beetles as a whole group's distribution across the continents. So you can see that um, except for the very cold north and the Antarctica, dung beetles are ubiquitous. Um, just some fun dung beetles stories from around the world. So um, there's one dung beetle that's called the horned dung beetle. This is a, a dung beetle that's found in North Africa and Asia. It's actually been introduced to the US and Texas as well and in Australia. And this is the strongest known insect. It's been shown to be able to pull more than a thousand times its own body weight. So this would be like a human pulling like 18 semis or something like this. So kind of in crazy feet for an insect. And then in South Africa, there's a, a really interesting dung beetle that has switched to being a flightless dung beetle because it lives in a very dry climate. So it uses its wings instead of flying to capture the water within and also make a little pocket of air that it can store carbon dioxide and oxygen in and breathe with underneath its wings. And it's able to survive in drier climates than some of the other dung beetles. So it's kind of traded out its wings for uh, desiccation adaptation. In New Zealand, you may be aware that originally there was no native mammals whatsoever, except for a few species of bats. And all mammals um, have been introduced to the islands since um, colonization of human activity. The native dung beetles in New Zealand um, actually feed on the droppings of bats, birds, reptiles, and even giant snails. And they're mostly limited to the forest ecosystem. Um, however, now there have been several introductions of dung beetles in New Zealand um, with the introduction, especially of sheep, which is a major livestock on those islands. There was a big need for the removal of the dung. So the dung was just starting to pile up and nothing was controlling it. The native dung beetles didn't know what to do with the sheep dung. And um, since the 50s, there have been a couple of reintroductions. Actually, seven of the species that have been reintroduced there were not reintroduced until the last 20 years or so. Um, but these reintroductions have helped remove a lot of that sheep dung that had been a big problem with the introduction of the sheep livestock industry to New Zealand. Similarly, in Australia, where we have all of our weird marsupial mammals, and there was a big introduction of livestock from Europe, there was not a lot of dung beetles that could handle the types of excrement that the new livestock was producing. And Australia has also seen a very large amount of introduction of dung beetles to help assist with um, that removal of the dung. However, in Australia, some of these introductions have become a problem and are competing and outcompeting some of the native dung beetles. In the United States, we've also seen a large introduction of dung beetle species, and I'll be talking about that in depth a little bit more. Um, but the reintroduction efforts have pretty much stopped in the last 20 years, and we haven't had any new species reintroduced. Um, and then just something else to note is dung beetles are probably one of the most important decomposers of dung within grassland systems, but they're also much more diverse actually within tropical systems. And in tropical systems, there's probably quite a few species of dung beetle that we haven't even discovered at this point. And that's where the vast majority of the diversity of dung beetles is. But in tropical systems, we also have a very large suite of other types of insects that act as decomposers. So the importance of, de of dung beetles in decomposing within those systems as a proportion of the overall decomposers is not quite as important as within grasslands. So um, here I'm talking a bit more specifically about the dung beetles of North America. So 
there's quite a few species in North America, but it's not that large when you compare it to that overall 9,500. Um, I have been trying to research this number in depth, and my best guess is there's about 323 species of dung beetle, um, which are mostly within the, the scarabinidae subfamily, the true scarabs. And then we still have quite a few in that aphodinae. Those are the tiny dung beetles and um, about 28 in the geotrupidae. So the dung beetles that we have in the US, um, as I mentioned in the last slide, about, so 23 of those are, are the non-native dung beetles that were introduced into the, into the United States purposefully. And then we also have another 10 species that were accidentally introduced. So these are species that likely came over when livestock were being brought, um, such as cattle from Europe. And when there's livestock, there's dung. And when there's dung, there's often dung beetles. Um, so, or sometimes when you're just shipping hay or something like this, it can also bring over accidentally some insects. So we have also had several accidental new dung beetles. Um, the dung beetles that were in the North America before the introductions were probably quite diverse before the extinction of many of our large mammals during the last ice age about 11,000 years ago. But maybe with those extinctions of those big mammals, we lost quite a few species of dung beetles and the of the remaining dung beetles, um, the majority of them are dwellers or also beetles that feed on smaller mammal dung, such as um, those that feed on prairie dog dung, which used to be much more widely distributed across the Great Plains and would just roll the small pellets of the prairie dog dung away as a prepackaged ball. Um, there are definitely some dung beetles that can process the larger patties of the cattle dung, but it's actually not a large component of our native dung beetles. Um, and especially in our drier regions, there's very few dung beetles that can process those, those really big patties, which is why there was a reintroduction uh, of some of the non-native species was primarily for cattle dung to process that dung and help decompose it. Um, however, we also have the dung beetles that use bison dung as a main resource in our native guilds. And some of these have been able to switch over to the cattle dung and help process it. Although unfortunately there is still a pretty big difference between bison dung and cattle dung for the dung beetles. And I'll show you some data on that. Um, cattle came into North America pretty early actually the year after Christopher Columbus landed, although they didn't become widespread until about the 1650s. So then after this very large introduction, it became more evident that we need additional dung beetles to help remove this dung. Um, Hawaii was the first area where dung beetles were introduced. This was in 1909. This was primarily for the horn fly control. If you're familiar with the history of Hawaii, it's been one of the areas where there have been the most introductions of non-native species in the world. The US started introducing dung beetles in 1969 and has continued reintroductions until the 1990s. However, after this, there have been no new reintroductions this is because it's thought that the amount of dung beetles introduced are probably enough for the processing of the cattle dung and uh, more reintroductions would actually, or introductions, sorry, would actually start to compete with our native fauna and potentially cause them to decline. So here's actually some data from my site in Northeast Montana. I know it's a little bit complicated, but you don't have to understand everything that's going on here. But essentially this is a ordination analysis and it's a type of analysis that lets you understand complex information. In this case, each point is a community of dung beetles at a given site. And so a single dot is, comprises both the 
which species of dung beetle are there and their relative abundances. And these little six letter codes are actually the individual dung beetle species. So when two points are closer together on this ordination space, that indicates that those communities are quite similar in their dung beetle composition. And the color of the points corresponds to whether or not the site came from a bison or a cattle area. And what we can see is that in terms of their dung beetle composition, we actually do have pretty different dung beetle communities in our bison versus our cattle. And this is circling the non-native species. So we actually find that quite a few of those non-native species remain in the cattle area, five of our seven total non-natives um, within this system. And that suggests that those dung beetles that were introduced that feed on the cattle dung that came over from Europe are remaining with the cattle and feeding on that dung, whereas um, not that many of them have are feeding on the bison dung. And similarly, our native fauna are primarily still on the bison dung and haven't moved over to the cattle dung. Although I would also note that this is a region specific result. And for example, in Kansas, there's only one non-native species of dung beetle that is common across the state. But up in our in our some of our drier areas like eastern Montana, that's where we start to see a lot more of these non-native species. Um, just some interesting facts about dung beetles. So dung beetles are actually pretty good dispersers. They can fly around two kilometers a day is a good estimate of some of their maximum length. So they can hone in on a dung resource and fly a fairly long distance to get to that resource. They actually form pair bonds and will mate for life. So when you see those two dung beetles together rolling that ball, that's a, a mated pair that will stay together and um, actually will even sometimes exhibit parental care. Primarily the females exhibit parental care, but occasionally the males will as well in a few of the species. Um, as was mentioned by Jennifer, it's also been established that dung beetles use the Milky Way to navigate. This was actually a really cool study where uh, researchers put dung beetles within um, an, within an artificial system with the Milky Way being shown on the ceiling, and they put tiny little hats on the dung beetle where the control was a clear hat and the treatment was a um, opaque hat and see, saw if dung beetles could navigate and only the ones wearing the clear hats were able to navigate. So it was really interesting. And as you also might know, dung beetles were one of the animal groups worshipped in ancient Egypt. They were, um, they represented the god of the sun, which was said to push the sun across the sky as if it were a giant ball of dung. So dung beetles belong to three or four functional groups, depending on um, if you believe in the last one. So the first is our classic rollers. This is probably what you think of when you are thinking about dung beetles. These are the ones that go to the manure pat. They collect a ball. They use their um, little forearms to pack it into a tight little round thing that they can roll away. This helps them remove the dung from that really competitive environment where there's a lot of other insects and other organisms competing for that resource, which for, from their perspective is kind of limited and might occur only in one certain area. And they can roll that dung away, dig a tunnel somewhere else, and bury that dung as a resource for later. Next, we have our dwellers. So these are dung beetles that just bury right into the dung. They sometimes they consume the dung or lay their eggs directly in the manure pat, or they might um, do the same thing, but just very slightly under the patty where they'll make little balls and um, bury the dung, but only really on the soil surface level. And as I mentioned, most of our native dung beetles and actually quite a few of our non-natives are dwellers. This is probably our most abundant group within North America. And then we have our tunnelers. So these are dung beetles that will go into the dung. They'll make those little balls, but then they'll 
bury the dung directly under where the patty is formed and bring those balls down. A lot of times, just like in this illustration, they'll dig a really deep tunnel, but they'll um, add the dung balls along the tunnel to take advantage of that whole um, pathway. And a lot of the dung beetles do spend a lot of time in these tunnels. And sometimes the males of the spe different species will have these horns that they'll guard the tunnel with and they'll fight off other males that might be coming to try and steal their resources. Or when they're originally choosing their pair bonds, they um, actually fight the, the other males for a female. And that is also leading me to the final potential group of dung beetles. It's not usually listed, but it could be considered a whole other functional group, which is our dung thieves. And there are a few species that specialize in this way and do not make the balls themselves, but actually just go and steal balls from other rollers and tunnelers and um, take those balls and use them for consumption or laying their eggs. So here's a little bit about the life history of dung beetles. So dung beetles find their fresh new pot of manure. They um, bury those balls. A single ball um, will just have, if it's going to grow into a dung beetle, will just have a single egg within it. And that's where the, the larvae will hatch out and it will grow into a pupa and that will hatch out. It'll crawl up to the soil surface and turn back into that dung beetle. Or if they're the dwellers, those larvae will just be directly in the dung and they will develop into the, the adult as well and crawl out of the patty. So um, as we talked about a little bit before about the different types of metamorphosis in different insect groups, since dung beetles are beetles, they go through complete metamorphosis, which means that they um, have different life stages that they look completely different in, and then they have only this one final adult stage as the beetle. So if you're seeing a dung beetle and it's like a full adult beetle, that's its final life stage. It's not going to grow any larger. If you see a really tiny one, it's not going to grow into a bigger one. It's just a small species that is living in the dung and um, still helping you bury that dung, even though it's very small. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, they form the bonded pairs and they will, when they go and get stung together, they either will lay the one egg or they will use that as their food. So quite a bit of the dung is actually not um, having eggs inside. It's used as a, as a kind of larder that the two adults will go and consume from later on. And there's quite a lot of variety in how many generations they can have per year. Most of the species we have in North America will have two or three generations per year. That's the most typical. But um, sometimes some of the species only have one. Some of the, the really prolific ones can have up to six. And most of them, if they do get to an adult, will live one to two years. But there's actually one study that's shown um, at least one individual lived five years in the wild. They did some dung beetle tagging. So that's pretty interesting. And it's possible that they live longer and we just don't know that much about them in general. So there's, in general, there's very little information on um, insects at the individual level and their movement and their like whole life cycle. So because it's so hard to put tracking devices on something that small. So it's possible that a lot of the species do live longer and we just don't actually know. And then here's just a little bit about the dung beetle morphology. So it's important to understand what are the different parts of the dung beetle if you wanna get into knowing what specific species you have um, in your system. Um, so the kind of classic scarab features that we find to identify the, the scarabs, one of the, the really important ones is what we call lamellate antenna. So this kind of looks, it can look a little bit like a club at the end um, when the, the lamellate are closed. So the lamellate are these three um, like longer sticks that you can see in the middle of the, this um, slide on the end of the antenna. 
but the dung beetle can also open those up and that's essentially its nose that it's using to smell out in, where it can find its new dung source and even over long distances track a new resource. Um, then more specifically for the dung beetles, um, not just the scarabs, they have these tibial teeth on the foreleg. So I don't know, I call this the diggy arms that essentially they have these kind of scrapey, long teeth-like structures on their front legs. And they, they do use those to dig. They also use them to make the dung balls if they're rollers or tunnelers and pat the ball together. Um, it's also really common that a lot of the species will have these striae or these really long stripey um, patterns on their wings or their, uh, not their wings, but their um, um, elytra that cover the wings. So the wings are actually hidden underneath this outer shell that um, covers them and helps keep them from desiccating. And then also, I think Jennifer also already mentioned it, but the one really classic way to identify the larvae is they're always in this C-shaped form. And that's, that is for all um, scarab beetles. So it could, not all scarabs are dung beetles. So it could indicate that some other um, actual beetle, but if you're digging through a dung paddy and you see those C-shaped larvae, it's probably a dung beetle. Um, and then some of our bigger scarab species definitely can be identified with guides, but unfortunately the geotrupidae and the aphodiines are quite small and extremely challenging to ID and you really need experts to identify these species. So, and, and also unfortunately, um, insect taxonomists are another group that's in decline and it's hard to find good expertise um, within certain beetle groups, just like all other insects, but um, there's a few out there still and um, knowing these smaller species is really important because they represent a lot of the diversity of our dung beetles. So beneficial roles of dung beetles, it's really hard to um, just cover all of these. There's just so many. So I have, I think, three slides on just this one topic. So the maybe most important one is that they reduce pasture fouling. So this is when we just have too much dung in the system and it destroys the land because of how much dung is there. Um, so when we have the dung beetles and we help decompose and break down the dung, then we can remove this problem. They also decrease greenhouse gases and um, help bury carbon and store it in the soil. Because the dung isn't sitting there on the top of the soil, we don't have that runoff and um, putting those bad nutrients into our water. So they actually help improve water quality. They can increase the biomass of forage for ranching systems. They're an important food source for many birds and mammals. And actually burrowing owls are have been shown to bait the edges of their where they're nesting with dung to help them find dung beetles, which is one of the main prey of burrowing owls. And then as was mentioned, they're key seed dispersers. They also have many ways that they help improve the health of soils. So they help um, increase nutrient cycling. They make that process a bit faster. They keep that nitrogen in the soil. So instead of just having that as a, a gas runoff, we, um, or runoff, we have that brought down into the soil and stored along with many other important micronutrients that plants and animals need to survive. They aerate the soil and reduce the compaction and increase the, the drainage ability and decrease that leaching of those nutrients. And they're really important as pest fly control. So in ideal conditions, it's been shown that they can actually reduce cattle pest flies by up to 95% by quickly removing and breaking down that dung, which is also the resource that pest flies use when they're developing as larvae and they help control some of the gastrointestinal parasites of, um, of cattle and other livestock. So here's two of maybe our some of our worst 
offenders, um, the horn fly and the face fly and stung beetles are really effective at controlling both of those. Um, however, there's unfortunately a lot of threats to dung beetles. I would say it is true that we don't know much about their long-term population trajectories, but the species that we do know about do indicate they're declining. And there's also a lot of anecdotal evidence that's shown that surveys taken not um, unfortunately very standardized and regularly, but a rough comparison across a more loose collection of surveys has shown that they are in decline. Um, and why are they declining? It's a lot of the reasons that Stephanie mentioned. So we have um, habitat loss and also the loss of some of our big mammals that dung beetle are associated with. And then of course, our cattle dewormers that we've been talking about, they often are quite bad for dung beetles. Other synthetic pesticides can also um, harm dung beetles. Actually overgrazing, if, if the soil is just so compacted, if it gets to that level, dung beetles have a hard time burying dung and that can be a problem for dung beetles. And then finally, climate change. Um, dung beetles do like to have it a little bit more moist. They'll, they do better in a moist year than in a super dry year and increasing drought could be another big threat to dung beetles. <laughs> so how do you sample for dung beetles? Um, so one way that um, I won't go into it in depth since Stephanie already mentioned this, is we use this pitfall trap. This is an example of one that um, does have that, I, I put like a cattle grate over it, which helps prevent mice and things like that from falling in that you might not want. And also helps prevent, if you have it in an area with livestock, helps prevent them from stepping in and twisting their foot. Um, you can bait this with different types of dung. Um, it's been shown they like omnivore dung the most. I use pig dung, which is pretty disgusting, but quite effective. Um, but another way is also just to look directly in the dung. So you can just break it open with a stick. Um, a lot of times you can see the little tunneling holes where the dung beetles were. Sometimes you can see the dweller adults directly in the dung or those C-shaped grubs. Um, you can also flip the dung paddy over and look for evidence of the tunnelers underneath. And then just another reminder, many species are actually quite small. So two millimeters is a very small insect. And you might be seeing a big adult dung beetle from their perspective, but to you, it looks quite little. Um, so different chemicals affect dung beetles differently, although unfortunately, there's still that we, quite a few we don't know too much about. Um, so the moxidectin products are another dewormer alternative that have been shown to be less detrimental to dung beetles than the ivormectin products. Um, some that we know affect dung beetles if they're used at higher rates are the insect growth inhibitors like and diflubenzeron. Um, but they might not affect dung beetles at lower rates if they're if they are used only on the surface level. And um, some of our other insecticides, the methoprene and the organophosphates, there's just really not enough research specifically on dung beetles to understand their effects. But it's likely that at higher levels they would also have negative effects on our dung beetles. And here's yeah, just a nice picture of the little holes of some of our dung beetles going in. Um, these are probably tunnelers or dwellers that made tunnels within or underneath the dung. So what can you do to help protect dung beetles? Um, if you're a, a rancher producer, there's quite a few things you can do. Um, definitely reducing the use of dewormers. I've talked to quite a few ranchers that have completely stopped using dewormers and have not seen um, an, an increase in their pest fly population. So one is potentially that beneficial effect of the dung beetles also coming and helping remove the dung. Another one is that these dewormers warmers have been used quite a bit um, across the United States for quite a while now. And a lot of them may actually be seeing resistance at this stage, although we need more research on that topic as well. Um, another thing that ranchers can do is they can switch from the ivermectin to the moxidectin product. So cydectin is the brand name for one of the common moxidectins, um, reduce the use of the pores, and <clears throat> only using insecticides when the pest flies get bad. So we say when they reach these action thresholds, so they're different for different 
specify groups, but for example, 100 face flies per, per animal is considered the action threshold for um, cattle. And another idea is just to, to check, and you can combine this with trying out using a little bit less dewormers. So you can try it in a subset of your population, not using the dewormers and do fecal analysis, get your local extension agent to come out and um, check the, and or send off those fecals for um, analysis to determine if you see changes in the pest flies when you start using less of the dewormers. Um, additional things is, yeah, just to use, a, you, if you're concerned that this will be really detrimental to you economically, you don't have to just go all in. You can start with a smaller portion of your herd and see what happens if you don't use dewormers on a smaller portion. You can limit the use of insecticides to cooler times of year when beetles are less active. Um, and it is good to keep the livestock within one area of the pasture when they um, are, I have, after they've been treated, I think someone asked about this in the chat and the, the guidelines are for four weeks if you can um, after using an insecticide. However, um, any a length of time that you can keep them in a confined area is better, even if it's just a few days that's been shown to help um, reduce effects on the dung beetle. And then just another general tip for reducing these pest flies is it's if it's better not to overgraze. One reason is when the grass gets really short, that actually leads to increased pest fly consumption because the, the pests often can't climb very high up the grass. So they only climb up about three inches. So if you can keep the grass a bit taller, then that actually reduces the use of those or the um, rates of the, the consumption of those parasites and keeping the animals out on the range longer and not sending them to the feedlots um, is also good for the dung beetles. What if you're not a producer? There's still a few things you can do. So you can definitely choose the range fed meat and the organic meat that doesn't use these chemicals and harm the dung beetles. Of course, there's a lot of ways that you can support conservation on private and public lands. And I'm sure Xerxes has a lot of nice information on this topic for more investigation. And I think just promoting how cool dung beetles are. So hopefully you can go out and tell your um, friends and family about how interesting dung beetles can be. Um, so I'm currently doing a bit of research on dung beetles out in eastern Montana. One thing is just to find out which dung beetles are there because we know so little about the insects in this system. I'm also looking at how the shifts in these large grazers and um, small grazers as well affect the different dung beetle communities and also their body size because body size within a species can be a proxy for how much dung a beetle can bury. And I'm starting some projects working with local ranching groups, um, especially to test the effects of these dewormers or slowly leaving the use of these dewormers off the table to understand effects on the beetle community. So that's all I have for you. And I really appreciate you taking the time to listen and happy to hear any questions people might have. I just realized that I'm muted. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, we have some great questions for you as well. Um, so the US had a great dung beetle program in the 40s, 50s to 60s, finding appropriate beetles to introduce in the US until chemical company dollars diverted the livestock parasite um, to chemicals. Let's see, where is the question in this? Uh, are the universities or USDA possibly reconsidering, reinstating a similar um, dung beetle program? Yeah, there's not currently any introduction efforts in the U.S. and there are, there's 23 species that have been introduced and I believe you can still import those specific species, but there's no current work to introduce more species at this time. Um, the USDA laws have gotten quite a bit stricter since the last introduction efforts in the 1990s, but it's I think 23 additional species is probably enough and that gives you a pretty broad spectrum of what you can work with if you wanna add new species. So I, I think we're, we're at our capacity of the need for additional 
um, species that fill the niche of, of breaking down the bigger cattle, cattle, cat, cattle patties. Um, but also a lot of the smaller livestock already have native dung beetles that can do the job well. So I, I, I don't think it's needed at this time as is the over the short answer. Great. Um, so next question, if one of the bonded dung pair dies, does the other find a new mate or does it perish? Well, I, I definitely don't know the answer to that question. So I think that's a, that's a really great question. And yeah, someone should do a, a research project on it. Um, but I have no idea, to be honest. And I'm not sure anyone does. Like, like I mentioned, we just don't know very much about individuality and within insects in general. So next question, about what size are the larvae? I'm assuming this kind of depends on the size of the, the beetle as an adult as well, right? Yeah, this definitely just depends on the, the size of the uh, adult. So, um, you know, some of our bigger ones can, so if you ever dug in your yard and you saw the like June beetle grubs, those are the kind of on the larger end of dung beetle size. And then some of the small ones are quite small. If you're not looking carefully, you might not be able to notice them at all. They just look like tiny, tiny little white worms that might be living inside of the dung. Cool. Um, are they active through the winter in colder areas? If not, what happens to the dung produced during winter? Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of them are dormant through the winter, so they won't be nearly as effective um, on the dung. It depends on the how cold it gets, but most insects cannot operate definitely under freezing levels um, or are pretty slow at least at those times. So the dung beetles mostly go into a kind of low hibernation-like state underground, either as um, pupa or as the, the adult, and will not help decompose dung. Um, of course, they could help a little bit when it breaks out in the spring, but most of them do prefer the fresher dung as well. Awesome. Um, does increasing the use of lights in an area contribute to dung beetle population decline? Um, that's another great question that I don't know. I would guess it would because they do navigate by night. Um, and we do know that in general, adding lights can be bad for a lot of insect groups, but I don't know of any specific dung beetle studies on that topic. So I wouldn't want to speculate too much. Okay. Um, I've heard of people using garlic as an alternative to repel flies and cowherds and to benefit Dung beetles, have you seen this used? And if so, how successful has it been? I Yeah, I do know some ranchers that are using garlic and also apple cider vinegar as an alternative. Um, I think especially for ranchers that have a smaller herd, that's a viable option. And it, um, th at least the ranchers I've talked to have do seem to believe in it and think it's working and say they have reduced fly populations when they're using it. I don't know of any peer-reviewed papers on it, but I, yeah, anecdotally, a lot of ranchers do seem to believe in that strategy and feel like it's working. Um, I know at a really large scale that can become kind of difficult to get the quantities you might need, but it'd be a, an area to look into more for maybe commercial companies and to make it a bigger um, potential product that could be used at a larger scale. Great, uh, next question. IGR has been replaced with one that is safe for dung beetles. Is this true? Yeah, some of the, the IGR products have been shown to have negative effects when they're used at higher rates on dung beetles. I think if you use them very minimally, that there are studies that show not strong effects on dung beetles. So I think it's it's more about the, the details there of how much is being used. And if you use them directly as labeled, they're supposedly not too harmful for dung beetles and a, a better alternative. So with that, it's it's not um, 12.30, it's 12.40, but we've got more time here for any additional questions for Ellen in particular. I'd say, let's start with those. And then I've got two flagged in the chat that I will get to, and Raven will help direct and guide things um, from, the, from the chat and the Q&A. 
So far, I haven't seen any other questions come in specifically for Ellen. Um, so if anyone does have any questions for Ellen, please submit them. Um, otherwise, I think we should move into the questions in the Q&A section. And then I have a bunch from the chat that I pulled earlier for Steph. Um, so the first one, should we consider mechanical aeration of lawns? Sure. Okay. Good question. I, I wanted to answer that live rather than typing because it's a, a bit complex, but it allows us to illustrate some of these management principles. Aeration is done as a practice to counteract the effects of compaction and kind of replace what biodiversity would be doing otherwise. Lawns, turf lawns in particular, they're often managed as a monoculture of just a, or a, you know, a very limited culture of a few species of turf grass. And, and so they don't have all that different niche space of roots and things that naturally form channels and cause aeration and places for other things to live and grow. So um, thinking with a systems approach, you know, having lawns that are a bit more diverse that maybe have a few tolerable broad leaves in them is one way to think about reducing aeration, the, the need for aeration. Um, if, if the question is more asking, like, could aeration be directly uh, harming invertebrates? Yes, but I think the likelihood of it directly impacting one is, is small, just because the points where those metal prongs go in there to aerate, you know, are, um, are likely to miss most burrows, tunnels, um, or invertebrates, except for the unlucky few. So thank you for that question. Um, okay, so the next question, how does one get rid of fescue without herbicides on permanent pasture land? Okay, this one too is, is a bit more complex and may have, have nuance. I think it also depends on what climate this, this question is coming from. So it would be possible to clarify that. Um, that may help. It depends on um, what you're, if you still want to use it as pasture land, if you're trying to replace the fescue with other forage types. Um, you can diminish it through certain things like intensive grazing. Um, putting other species in there to, to compete. You know, it's, I guess there's not a silver bullet to answering that if you want to avoid using herbicides. Uh, I'm, I think herbicides in certain situations can be good for a long time. Biodiversity in cases of managing invasive weeds or other exotic species where they, you're then able to reintroduce or reestablish more diverse native communities. I hope that helps get to the question you were asking. And Ellen, if you have anything to add to that, I don't know if you do or not, but okay, all right, very good. Okay, next question. If we had access to T microscope, what are some tips on proper procedure in order to view some of the invertebrates found in soil? Could you could you repeat that? What kind of microscope? It says a T microscope. I don't. I'm not sure. I know what that is. I'm not sure either. Um, but mm -hmm. do you in general have some tips on on viewing invertebrates found in soil with a microscope? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they're they're similar to what you'd use to view other invertebrates, or even looking at plants or anything. You'd Look at under a microscope. Uh, having good lighting is important. That's coming from multiple directions, so you're not getting a lot of shadows or kind of deep contrast that will let you see these smaller structures and details. And then uh, it's you can hope make a there a needle. It's called a needle. It's just a pointed metal tip that has typically a wooden or plastic handle on it. You could make one yourself with a sewing needle if you wanted to, but they're also inexpensive to purchase a dissecting needle. 
uh, a pair of tweezers of some kind, things that tools that'll just help you move and manipulate these smaller animals. Great. And Ellen, please, please chime in if you'd like to add anything to that. Yeah, I guess maybe adding water helps sometimes to release the soil organism. If you're looking for really small stuff and you can't even see anything in your soil, then you can add a little bit of water. And a lot of times the smaller organisms can will come out and be visible. Awesome. Um, next question. I'm familiar with inoculating soil with earthworm castings, but I don't release worms into orchards. Good to know about the impact on native species. Does the impact negate the benefits to soil conservation? I'm guessing yes. This question is a good question, and it's somewhat context dependent. Our, our general answer to this is in most agricultural soils, they probably have introduced earthworms anyway, and you're not necessarily going to be getting rid of those. And they can um, be playing important roles as well, like kind of remediating over, over compaction, helping create channels and burrows. Where earthworms are a primary ecological concern are in forested areas where they are, they're now introduced species and where they're just overly effective at churning through that organic plant residue that would normally persist on the soil surface. And when that residue does persist, that creates a micro habitat. It's cooler and moister, and there are certain animals that are adapted and require those conditions. Certain forest floor plants or seeds and seedlings require those conditions as well. So when earthworms are present, they're often removing that and just leaving this bare mineral soil that's exposed to drying um, and less or no habitat for those plants and animals that would otherwise be there. Great. Um, were the jumping earthworms released intentionally or was it an accident? Um, those I believe is, were, were accidental or it's, it was an inadvertent introduction. Cool. Um, next question, to preserve dung beetles, how long should cattle that have been wormed remain off of agricultural fields? Yeah, um, I, yeah, I saw that in the chat before. So that the official guidelines are four weeks, but essentially as long as you can as well. So if, if you can't do the full four weeks, then if you can just do one week, that's still better than nothing. So if you can kind of concentrate the the worming area to one pasture and not spread the dung out in the larger ecosystem that can help the dung beetles. Great, so those are all of the questions that I found in the chat and the Q&A. Um, if anyone does have any questions, please submit them now. Just a reminder that this course will be added to the Farming with Soil Life playlist on our Xerces YouTube channel. And all of you who registered um, will receive a link to that recording and the PDFs of the presentations, as well as the e-packet um, that we shared with you at the start. So any other questions? Don't think so. Um, thank you so much to Stephanie and also to Ellen. Um, it was fantastic. Um, yeah, so that's, that's it.